Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Academy. We have a very special guest on the channel today um, who has some really interesting experiences and in has graciously agreed to share with us today. Um, we'll begin with a quick intro about him and then dive into the questions. So Dr. Guru Sedapati is a forward-thinking leader, writer, and creator with a 20-year track record spanning Fortune 100 companies, consulting, startups, and academia. He has dedicated his career to harnessing um, the transformative potential of AI, and it's, is a passionate advocate for ensuring its fairness and trustworthiness. Um, his work as co-founder and CEO of FairNow embodies this commitment as he's building a startup that um, helps HR tech vendors and organizations create responsible AI solutions. Uh, throughout his career, Guru has focused on two intersecting trends, um, the impact of data analytics and artificial intelligence and the flourishing of talent and human capital. His roles have varied from being um, an M&A uh, investment banking analyst at JP Morgan to an influential consultant at McKinsey and Company, where he guided corporations on leveraging um, data and technology, to a strategic leader at Capital One, where he advised the president and led the development of innovative HR technologies. Um, as an assistant professor of economics at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, um, he conducted really cool groundbreaking research on how technology and globalization are reshaping work and skill demands. Uh, his academic prowess is further backed by a PhD in economics from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree in computer science from Stanford. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Guru to Academy, um, where he will sh be sharing with us um, his expert views on his startup company, um, his startup journey at FairNow, ethical and responsible AI development, and uh, the impact of AI on job the job market. Um, and before we begin the questions, uh, do you have anything to, to add here? here? No, Ashika, thank you for having me. Um, I'm flattered by your introduction and look forward to chatting with you. Awesome, wonderful, I am, I am too. Um, so I guess we can kind of begin with uh, some questions around your your startup journey at FairNow. So what kind of motivated you to begin FairNow and focus on building um, responsible HR tech solutions? Yeah, um, I think there are two motivating factors, one quite practical and one kind of more observing trends. The practical aspect is um, as, a, as an executive at Capital One, where I was leading the people analytics and technology function, um, came across many kind of technology vendors who would approach us um, claiming that they were building AI solutions for all aspects uh, of, of HR. And we had the capabilities to dig into those solutions and realized in many cases, they weren't actually building AR solutions or they were not building them responsibly. And we had a pretty high standard internally. And so that's when I realized there was a real need for um, for HR organizations to have get help in terms of understanding what they were buying, why they were buying it, and in fact, if these solutions were working well, if they were fair, if they were compliant, and all these things. Most HR organizations don't have the internal resources to, to figure those things out. So that was kind of the practical side of things. The other observation is that, um, and I'm going to take a kind of a longer view and date myself a little bit here, but if you look back over the last 30 years, the digital era has evolved in multiple stages, right? And starting from like the late 90s, you had the internet era. Um, I would say maybe the last 15 years have been around the data and cloud era. Um, and going forward, I think is going to be the AI era. And each era builds on the past, but one underlying theme has been the importance of trust. So if you look at kind of the, you know, the, the internet era, um, before Amazon and the others became big, you know, people were saying that nobody would submit their credit card information online. Nobody would be willing to buy a product from a vendor that they have never heard of before. Um, and all that is laughable now that we're way far on the other side of that canyon. But that was only possible because of technologies and mechanisms that built trust in that system, right? Think about how new that digital commerce it was, right? And, and there are so many ways it could have gone wrong because of a lack of trust. And so it's really important to build that trust. And so um, if you map that again to the cloud um, data era, you have 
issues around data security and data privacy and who owns what data, fraud, you know, all of these things, again, potentially disrupting the possibilities of this era. But then you had a lot of companies building infrastructure to protect against those things and to build trust in, in data ecosystems. And so I say all that to say, I, you know, I think trust is one of the common trends that's important throughout this digital, you know, digital time. And that's going to be ever so more important during the era of AI. And so thinking about that trend, it was important for me to think about, hey, if I'm bullish on this technology, which I am, I'm very bullish on AI, if we want it to succeed, then we need to be able to build trust in this ecosystem. And so that was a motivating factor for me to start yeah. there now. Awesome. That, that's amazing. And I think that's especially so applicable with the rise of generative AI and things becoming more kind of autonomous and machine oriented. Um, and I think one of the things you you highlight um, as uh, the important components of building this trustworthiness is um, concepts of like fairness, compliance, explainability and effectiveness. Um, could you elaborate on kind of these concepts and and why you think they're they're so integral in, in building this trust? And, technology yeah these are the fundamental elements of trust right if you um are a, a customer of a company that is selling ai technology you need to ensure that it's not biased you need mm -hmm. to ensure that it's compliant with any laws and regulations you need to uh, ensure that it's not a black box right? right that it's explainable especially in the hiring context you can't use a black box to hire people yeah there are many contexts like that if you think about lending if you think about hiring if you think about housing decisions if you think about medical decisions these are all areas where we as humans have expected to have answers to the question, why or why not did we get rejected, right. right? That's been built into the ecosystem of how we interact with these systems. And so you can't go from that kind of explainability to, hey, the model just said so, right? So to build trust, you have to kind of you know preserve the elements of the, uh, the old uh, systems of trust that we had. Right. Um, fairness is a very complicated one. It's, uh, there are many different definitions of fairness, mm -hmm. uh, as mathematicians can tell you, and not all of them are equally, uh, not all of them can you optimize for simultaneously, right? They're, they're often contradictory. And so it's really important to think through what definitions of fairness actually matter in which context. And there's a lot of research, groundbreaking research being done uh, on this topic. Um, also the top uh, around data, like uh, in the real world, data is incomplete or imperfect. And so how do you think about fairness in light of that? Uh, mm -hmm. So we're working on some innovative solutions there. Um, and then in terms of um, effectiveness, uh, models can um, change in their performance over time, right? They're not a kind of static uh, um, situation, right? And so they can improve over time. And, and we see that with some of the generative AI foundation models mm -hmm. and how much GPT-4 is better than GPT-3.5 and, and GPT-3 and, and so on. Right. You're seeing incredible improvements, but that's not a given. Um, and un, un, unless you're monitoring and very carefully uh, thinking about how your models are functioning, the data and the inputs that are going into your models, they can actually drift and, and, and perform worse over time. And, and so all of these are really important from, uh, from a perspective of trust and making sure that people who are using these technologies can... Mm -hmm. uh, can, can really trust these uh, these tools and these and these technologies. So to me, when I think about trust, it's fairness, compliance, explainability, and effectiveness. Wonderful, yeah. Um, and how have your previous work experiences, such as um, at Capital One, McKinsey, and also the prior economics experiences, um, like at Johns Hopkins, um, Columbia, played a role in your approach to to building Fair Now? Yeah. One of, one of the things I've always been interested in is kind of merging the humanities with the technical fields. I've kind of had my foot in both worlds in some way, and economics was a manifestation of that. It's a social right. science, but deeply technical, right? Which is why I love, I love the field. Mm -hmm. um, and so this topic of trust and technology kind of, you know, sits on the boundary of both kind of the humanities as well as um, the technical fields, right? Mm -hmm. And um, trust is a fascinating concept. Um, I, I think it's one of the more under uh, talked about, discussed mm -hmm. uh, concepts there is. Trust is so important. And I, I think only when you sit down and really think deeply about uh, trust, you realize how important it is every single day mm -hmm. that you interact with people. Uh, it could be socially, it could be economically, it could be commercially, it could be in so many different fashions. But we trust so many things that people say, that they do, that they sell, that they buy. 
And, and there's only, and, and of course you could argue there's there's legal recourse, there's this recourse, but all those recourses are very costly, right? Yeah. And at the end of the day, you're really banking on people's trust, right? right. On so many elements of our systems. And th- all this trust is necessary to build the amazing things we've built, whether it's mm-hmm. technologies, large organizations. Think about it. We have companies and organizations that employ a m- million people. Walmart employs a million people. Right. Uh, Amazon employs more, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're bigger than most cities. And, and so how do you bring together people who don't know each other, right. who are not family members, friends, they're, they're all very kind of, you know, um, uh, strangers in a sense. And how do you get them all rowing in the same direction, yeah. right? Um, all of that requires trust, right? Yeah. Um, and then trust of our institutions, of our government institutions, our economic institutions, right? All of this matters for the country rowing in the same direction, right? So you can you just think about every day, all the way from the micro to the macro, Trust is underpinning um, almost everything that happens in society. And then now you have this technology that comes along, AI, mm-hmm. right? It's new and it's potentially one of the most great, you know, groundbreaking and game-changing technologies that we right. will ever see in my lifetime and potentially yours. And um, and, and it's scary in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. And we'll probably talk about that a little bit too later on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is an area where trust is going to matter a lot. You can't right. just have AI in the power, you know, the hands of a few. Um, uh, and building these technologies. I think everyone has to have a voice in how this technology unfolds, how its um, its profits and its rents, like how is that going to unfold? Right. The training data for AI, for instance, comes from all of the work that we do, right? AI is mining the entire, the generative AI is mining all the digital data out there, including all of your interviews that you've done, Ashika. Right. right? You have a stake in the training data of these systems. <laughs> okay? So all those have a stake, whether it's our jobs, whether mm-hmm. it's the training data, um, whether it's it's our use of this uh, technology and our work, we have a stake in it. And I think um, the trust is going to be just an incredibly important feature. Right. Yeah, I completely agree. And kind of digging a bit more into that, um, I think my next question is closely related to, to what we've been talking about. Um, but some of your LinkedIn posts um, discuss uh, New York City's Local Law 144 and other such uh, regulations. Um, how... And they also discuss kind of how data and trust um, will be the two most important differentiators between AI companies, good ones versus ones that might not succeed um, or might be dangerous to society. At a high level, um, what what does it mean for for AI to be trustworthy? And more importantly, um, how can people begin to think about developing trustworthy AI from the ground up? Yeah, good question. I mean, one of the big benefits of these laws that are coming into place, I actually have quite a bit of disagreement on the New York City Local Law 144. I don't like some of the things that it's doing and some of the mm-hmm. incentives that it's creating. No. Uh, we do not have time to talk about that today. But what I do appreciate is that it is causing people to think about this topic. Right. It is causing people to think about, okay, wait, I need to slow down a little bit. I need to make sure I'm being well-governed, well-managed. I need to be responsible with this stuff instead of just a full-on, like, uh, you know, 100 mile per hour rush into building and using these technologies. Um, I I don't think we're going to, um, uh, there are companies out there that are saying, hey, we're not going to use AI. I don't think that's a good answer. (laughs) It is an incredible technology. It is going to become more and more useful every single day. And to, uh, to put blanket statements like that is not useful. Right. But at the same time, I also don't um, uh, think that companies that are rushing into it blindly are also, you know, I think they're also doing a disservice, right? And so I think there's a happy medium of, hey, let's use this technology, let's figure out where it's useful, let's figure out how it can be impactful, but let's start building the right gov- practices and governance structures in place, right? right? And to that end, I think doing that early on and building that those practices from an early stage is going to be helpful. I think it's going to be a lot harder to, to add that on when you're already deep into um, your, your journey, right? Yeah. And so when I think about kind of what does governance, good governance look like, mm-hmm. right? I think, first of all, thinking through, uh, I would split it up into both data and then uh-huh. models, right? Because mm-hmm. data and data governance is important as well as model governance. And those are two separate things. Uh, d- uh, you know, when people think about AI, they think, oh, the models, how are the models working? Right. Are, are they biased and whatnot? But all of the, the data is 80% of it, right? Like what data you have, how good is your data? Is your data biased? Mm-hmm. What's the quality of your data? How are you thinking about data privacy? And how are you thinking about data ownership? And how are you thinking about data usage? And, 
And when it comes to data, there's already a lot of laws on the books and a lot of standards around good data practices, right? Mm-hmm. So I'd encourage people to start looking into those um, if they're interested. Uh, mm-hmm. What are good practices? What are responsible practices around good data governance? Right. Uh, there's already SOC standards and ISO standards around this that mm-hmm. one can kind of research and look into. Then you have the model side of things, right? Model governance and what are best practices around building models, validating models, testing models. Okay. How do you document models? Um, how do you um, write uh, inventory models, right? There's a whole set of things that you can think through there. And then also how do you check for biases and explainability and all that? So there's a whole framework mm-hmm. that we have at Fair Now across both data and model governance mm-hmm. yeah. that we think are best practices. And again, we're starting to help companies build these practices uh, from the early days. Right. Awesome. Um, and so I know that at Capital One, you worked on some kind of AI-based simulation technology. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on um, <clears throat> how AI-based simulation technology can can change how people learn and make decisions and kind of how you ensured the accuracy and reliability of these tools that, that you helped develop? Yeah, I think, um, gosh, there's so many amazing use cases for AI. And I think learning is, is going to be um, the learning space and helping mm-hmm. people, learn, whether it's in the, you know, the purely the education environment, K through 12, college, or learning on the job, right? In fact, uh, learning on the job is something I, have, you know, I often talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, most of our skills are acquired on the job. Right. Right. As you get further along in your own career, Ashka, you will realize that and, you'll, and, yeah. and, and what you learned in school will be further and further away from kind of how your mm-hmm. human capital is formed. Right. And so most of your human capital will be formed on the job through work. Right. One of the interesting, um, you know, kind of insights in the learning space is that mm-hmm. people are much, much better at learning while doing. Mm. Right, or learning by doing is what it's called, right? Right. And as opposed to sitting in a course, taking notes, and hearing someone else do it. Yeah. And so learning by doing is essentially like you getting your hands dirty, doing whether it's coding, whether it's running a model, whether it's fixing a bicycle, like whatever it is. Yeah. I know I like this. I'm going to guess you are too. We all learn better by trying it ourselves, right. making mistakes, and then fixing it and getting better, right? And that's one of the things that we created. We created a simulator that allows people not just to attend courses on important concepts at Mm -hmm. Capital One, but to actually play around with those concepts through a simulator and and, and get feedback on how their decisions went, what were the implications of their decisions, how often did they go right, how often did they go wrong, what was the mistake underlying those decisions, almost trying to replicate a real world kind of economics scenario Mm -hmm. where they could see the, the manifestations of their decisions. Um, and then getting real-time feedback, right? Not having to wait days or weeks or months right. or years in the real world to see what would happen from your decisions, but to getting real-time probabilistic feedback on kind of your decisions and just trying to then speed up. And that just speeds up the iterative process of learning, right? Like uh, the way learning works is through, you know, you you have information, you process information, mm-hmm. you make a decision, you get feedback from the the, the ecosystem, and then you update and then you get better um, there's a concept, I don't know if you've heard of this, called kind versus wicked systems. Mm. Have, you heard, have you heard of that? I've heard of it. Yeah, for your audience who hasn't, um, kind systems are one where the rules of the, the, uh, the rules of the engagement are very clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, chess, for instance, the rules are very clear. Right. And the feedback is quick and clear. Okay, so those right. are kind of the two features of a kind system. Wicked systems are the opposite of that, right? So for instance, raising kids is, is a wicked system, right? You don't know exactly what the rules are there. Yeah. For any parent out there, they would appreciate this. You know, raising children is a wicked system. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what's what you're even solving for necessarily. Right. And the feedback is not accurate and instantaneous, right? Uh, versus something <laughs> like chess or tennis, uh, yeah. there are kind systems. You know what the rules are. And if you hit the ball uh, without turning your wrist over, it's going to fly out of bounds, right? And so you get the... Uh, you get the feedback instantaneously. Um, so one of the things we hope the simulation would do was to mm-hmm. take wicked wicked problems and convert that into kind situations where you get more instantaneous right. feedback more quickly and, 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 and really help people learn that way. And so I do think AI and simulations are going to be able to help people learn more quickly, learn faster, get feedback. And I think there's tremendous opportunity in that space. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, and 
kind of pivoting a bit to to kind of the the impact of AI on the job market and skills. Um, in your opinion, what opportunities do you see arising from um, AI adoption in HR, people analytics, talent, that kind of space? And how can individuals and organizations capitalize on like this opportunity going forward? Yeah, let me answer that more broadly beyond sure. HR. Um, I, I do think you know, one of the things you often hear anytime there's a technological revolution is, right. oh my gosh, how many jobs is it going to replace and what jobs are under threat and what, you know, so on and so forth. And I always take those with a, a huge pinch of uh, mm -hmm. salt. You know, in my research, uh, through many examples, through many decades, you find that when a technology comes out, it doesn't actually replace jobs right away, mm -hmm. right? In fact, what happens early in the beginning is, it, first of all, it takes a long time for the technology to roll out. It doesn't happen overnight, right? Mm -hmm because it takes a long while for, for consumers and users and companies to understand how to even fit the technology into their business practices, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes time. Second of all, there's actually a lot of upskilling. A lot of people kind mm -hmm. of upskill to start working with the new technology. So it actually right. creates an opportunity for upskilling. It creates an opportunity for new jobs. Mm -hmm. Think about all the jobs that exist today where a computer is in play, where data is in play, where you know there's so many data scientists and software engineering roles none of these roles existed 40 years ago right right it, it, like millions and millions and millions of jobs have been created and so you know and so something similar will happen here right like mm -hmm. there will be new jobs that are created um and there will be an opportunity for people who are doing stuff related to this space to upskill what they're working on right right that being said, yeah, some jobs are gonna change. A lot of jobs are gonna change. There's a nice example that I use when ATMs came out, mm -hmm. people were worried that the job of the teller was gonna go away. And it actually didn't go away in the, you know, for, uh, it, it actually went up in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that's, um, I can't remember the name of the law, but there's a law where mm -hmm. when a new technology comes out, it makes things more efficient, that lowers the price of things and actually causes demand to go up. Mm -hmm. Therefore you need more jobs in right. the, in the like in the immediacy, you actually yeah. need more mm -hmm. to fill in the gap. And so tellers actually went up for a while, even though ATMs were <laughs> existing. Right. Um, and then they started to come down, but they still never went away because the role of the teller just changed. Right. It transformed. There's an opportunity to upskill there. There's an opportunity to define a new role. And the, and the role changed. And it kind of, it happened over such a gradual time that it didn't quite feel like a job displacement, Right. Um, I'm not going to say necessarily that every trend is going to be like that. Right. Uh, maybe AI is different. Maybe things happen more quickly. Um, I do have concerns around the creative fields, for mm -hmm. instance. There's a big thing going on right now in Hollywood, and I'm sure you and your listeners are probably familiar with that. Uh, but that's an area I am worried about, right? right. People who are writers and actors mm. and entertainers and creators of content. Um, the current the generative AI technology is is quite creative at right. creating content because what it is doing is essentially taking the entire wisdom of the world around creative content mm -hmm. and synthesizing it. Right? Yeah. So of course it's going to be good. And um, where AI is not good today is around logic and accuracy and right. those kinds of things. But that's not important for content creation. That's not important mm -hmm. for creative content creation, right? So that's a place right away where you can see AI potentially disrupting things. Right. But in but in many other jobs, even in white collar jobs, uh, blue collar jobs, I, I think there's, you know, AI could be potentially helpful, but right. I don't see replacing those jobs right away. And in yeah. even many white collar jobs, I think it's in the in the short to medium term, it's going to make us better and more productive, but it is going to require all of us to upskill and to learn and improve our capabilities so that we can work with these technologies going forward. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, in addition to that upskilling component, just ensuring that the technology that's being developed is, again, going back to what you're saying, trustworthy and fair. And I think that's the the key to kind of getting it to aid us rather than replace us. So, so yeah, um, amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to share your insights and perspectives um, on these super interesting and, and relevant topics with us. Um, lastly, is there is there a good way that that people can reach out to you if they have any Additional questions. Yeah, you can. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so come find me on LinkedIn and feel free, uh, free to shoot me a message there. Feel free to Ashika if you want to send that people my LinkedIn yeah. um, uh, 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 link. Um, but thank you again for 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 having me. I think all of us as a society are going to be discussing and debating these questions, and so this was a great conversation. Yes, definitely. So yes, um, as you said, the info uh, will be linked in the description of this video. 
Um, thank you again, Guru. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, looking forward to, to following your exciting journey at FAIR now. Um, thank you to everyone that, that watched this video and I'll see you next time.